Welcome, uh, everybody. Um, hope you're all well. Uh, thank you uh, for joining us today on this webinar, looking at liquidated damages in the construction industry, uh, what to do and what to be aware of. Uh, my name is uh, Paul Gibbons, and I am the founding director and chief executive of Decipher Consulting. As we all know, liquidated damages are commonly used in construction contracts around the world. These damages need to be managed. And in cases where there may be a windfall for one party relying on the liquidated damages provision, this will lead uh, in, in inevitably to opposed views on the interpretation and application of the LAD clause. And this will require constant attention by the parties. Today, our webinar will not be a presentation through uh, PDFs. It's more going to be like a fireside chat and a panel discussion, which will be led by Quentin Tannock. So let me introduce the uh, panelists. Uh, so Quentin Tannock is from Four Pump Court. He's a barrister and acts and advises in complex and high value arbitrations, litigations and mediations. He joins, sorry, he enjoys working in a team on larger disputes and is regularly instructed as sole counsel. He has sole counsel experience in the ICC, the LCIA, the LMAA and ad hoc arbitrations, as well as in the High Court and Court of Appeal. Sam Beer is a legal director at Hill Dickinson. He has over 18 years of experience handling complex disputes and in this time, he has dealt with disputes through litigation, arbitration, adjudication. In addition, he has extensive experience of alternative dispute resolution forums, such as mediation. And he specializes in contentious construction matters, acting for contractors and specialist subcontractors in respect of time and money, as well as professional negligence matters. And Sam's work has, has been recognized by the Legal 500 directory, whose 20 23 testimonials says he pays excellent attention to detail and is persistent in trying to achieve the best outcomes for his clients. I'm pleased also to be joined by Anthony Hayes, an associate in delay at Decipher. Anthony has over 15 years experience in planning, working on large scale projects across the globe. And as I say, he's an associate here at Decipher. His most recent roles include leading teams of planners and engineers to deliver fast track projects in manufacturing. And, and then Anthony deals with live planning and delay matters, and he provides advice on time-related matters to a, to a variety of employers and contractor clients that we have here. And finally, we are, we are also joined by Steve Warno. Steve is a senior consultant here at Decipher, who began his career at Cruden. Uh, he progressed onto the projects team uh, and prior to joining Decipher. Stephen was a senior quantity surveyor on two Ministry of Justice accommodation projects. And as I say, he's a key member of our quantum expert team here at Decipher. So those are the panelists. Um, I'll hand over now the baton to Quentin to kick off with the discussion. So Quentin, over to you, please. As Paul said, I'm Quentin Tannock, a barrister at Four Pump Court. And as Paul outlined, we're gonna focus today on our chat on the topic of liquidated damages in construction contracts. Um, Sam Beer from Hill Dickinson will firstly outline um, the types of liquidated damages clauses typically seen in construction contracts and what limits they are to liquidated damages, as well as discussing some of the recent relevant case law. Um, Stephen Woolner from Decipher will consider preparing and defending um, liquidated damages claims together with the risks that surround such claims. Um, and Anthony Hales, also from Decipher, will address the often critical issue of delay, which of course is is frequently an area of dispute in construction contracts. As I understand that some of you are very well versed in respect of liquidated damages, but others have little, if any, relevant experience and are here to learn the basics. At the risk of pleasing none of you, I'll try to please all of you by first providing a brief introduction to liquidated damages. So what are liquidated damages in construction contracts? Well, when parties to a construction contract agree to liquidated damages, what they're doing is they're agreeing in advance to a fixed sum or fixed sums payable as damages should there be a particular breach or breaches of contract. A typical example might be when a project completion is delayed. And that's something that I'll ask Anthony Hayes some questions about in due course. But why are liquidated damages agreed? 
As, as Paul said, liquidated damages clauses are common in construction contracts, not only in the UK, but also internationally, but why? And this is because managing risk in a construction project involves a wide range of considerations. There can be many, many events that impact on a planned program of work. And a key issue is who carries the commercial risk associated with those events. So while this is not a session specifically about delay, but to continue with that example, the commercial consequences of delay can be significant. Loss of rent, loss of production, additional funding costs, for example. And liquidated damages can be a mechanism to manage and plan for the risk of delay. They've got the obvious advantage of saving time and costs, improving what actual losses were incurred. Employers benefit from not having to take non-commercial steps to mitigate their loss, or to identify and account for, give credit for benefits where they do mitigate loss, for example. Contractors might benefit from an effective limitation of liability, for example, where delay costs are assessed without having to take into account what actual and possibly greater loss an employer may have suffered. So that's the production context. Now, of course, liquidated damages clauses are used in a wide variety of sectors, and all of those sectors can give rise to relevant case law that will then impact on the way that the courts will apply liquidated damages clauses in the construction context. A particularly fertile field for this is IT, where liquidated damages payments often take the form of service credits, for example. And one of the cases that Sam Beer will consider, Triple Point, arose in the IT or the software context. Recently, the credit hire space has given rise to an interesting decision now on its way to the Supreme Court called Armstead versus RSA. More from me on that later. And shipping. Uh, there's a relatively rich stream of case law in respect of ship hire contracts or charter parties as they're known, where the equivalence of liquidated damages are often, often agreed, usually based on the hire, the daily hire or charter party rate. So these are all other industry areas, examples of other industry areas where liquidated damages are used and that give rise to case law that may be relevant. Stephen, uh, perhaps what, what uh, might be useful then to start with you, with you with is I wondered if you could maybe give us some practical or worked examples of liquidated damages in action in, a, in the construction context. So I gave a brief outline of what liquidated damages are. Um, but just to think of a few examples, what about the case where a company wants to construct a shop uh, and a warehouse, but due to the high cost of the build and high rent on their current premises, they want to start using, say, the warehouse as soon as possible before the rest of the, the, the work, the shop is ready. How would a company structure their liquidated damages in those circumstances? Yes, okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so yes, in, in, in this scenario, um, at the outset of the project, um, you, you, although you hope that there'll be no delay or any, any issues with completing by the date, unfortunately it does happen and it happens quite a lot. So you'll start to think about that. And then in, in the scenario that you've just mentioned, Quentin, uh, there, are two, there are two areas, which is ultimately the, the, the warehouse uh, and the shop, and you, you want to use uh, one before the other. And I've come across this quite a lot. I've done work in education where you might be building a new school and they want uh, the school wants phased opening so they can use parts of the school earlier than another section. So it's quite common to see uh, a phased or a sectional completion in your contract. And, and like you mentioned, uh, it gives benefits to both parties. Um, one side gets the, the use of part of the project earlier than waiting till the end, uh, but the contractor is also relieved of some of their obligations, uh, such as maintaining insurance for that particular section. Um, it is quite common, as we said, and so both uh, the main standard forms of contracts we use uh, in the UK cater for sectional completion. Um, so in the JCT, you can, you can write down the, the, the particular dates and the, the liquidated damages that flow in the contract particulars. And then in the under the NEC contract, you've got the use of X5 for sectional completion with X7 for the delay. And again, you can put uh, certain areas for particular sections in there. What we do sometimes find though, is that parties do run into problems uh, in respect of sectional completion. 
And this is when they don't make the, the mechanism or, or the provisions for LADs for these sections not very clear or they're, they're ambiguous. Uh, the risk is that if you don't divide the damages correctly or reduce it in proportion to the part that's completed, then if it is challenged, it could be that the whole provision is struck out and you're left with having to then make a claim for liquidated damages, taking away that benefit that you've got from, from uh, putting into the contract in the first instance. So when you're calculating your, your liquidated damages, um, what are the things that you should be looking for? Um, we've mentioned here a warehouse and a shop. So if I, if I stick to those, we're looking for the, the types of losses that will be foreseeable on, on, on a project that includes those things. Um, so we're looking for two, basically two sections, and we're going to put two liquidated damages provision or losses together that they can claim if a completion date is missed. Uh, again, you've already touched on it, Quentin, but we've got, say, rent on the, the present premises. So if the project is, so if we take the, the warehouse as the first section, uh, you're already using, a, you've already got a warehouse, but uh, due to the completion date being missed, you have to extend the rent on that premises, or even worse, if you, the lease has run out and you now have to find alternative premises, uh, movement of equipment and cancellation charges, um, any insurances that you need to that you need to keep on to, in terms of the additional or the existing project, uh, warehouse and shop, um, the additional admin supervision costs for the build itself that have overrun. Um, a big one uh, potentially on this case would be your anticipated profit. So if your shop's not open, you've got a lack of turnover. Um, and so the profit will be affected. Also, the warehouse, I, I, obviously, in this scenario, you might have a nice, shiny new warehouse that's, that's producing a lot more than your existing premises, and therefore your, your turnover will be affected. Interest on lending to finance the project, um, as, you, as, as you previously mentioned. And then, and then a hot topic at the moment is to do with inflation. Costs are, uh, although slightly, um, cooling off. We've seen over the last couple of years uh, real increases in inflation and, and it might be that the costs that you anticipated uh, to be expending at the original completion date might be wildly different only a few weeks down the line and that could cause you some issues. Um, one thing that I would ask people to consider though is that when you're calculating your liquidated damages uh, so input into your contract, as well as the revenue. Think about any potential savings. Uh, while the project's not being used, you won't have the power, heating, water, or some insurances. We want to include those so that we, we are producing an accurate figure. Um, when you calculate it, please keep a detailed record of how you've come to those figures and retain the schedule and the justification because it may be that the other party doesn't agree at the outset and there has to be some negotiation in getting it into your contract or there may be some challenge further on down the line and you want to protect yourself against that. Super, thanks, uh, Stephen. Um, so what, what about the case where there are no liquidated damages provisions in the contract? So, for example, where... A company to secure a contractor agrees to take out liquidated damages clauses from the contract. How, how can an employer proceed if the project runs over and starts to cost them money in those circumstances? Okay. Yes. Um, so, so you do. You, we do see this in instances where, although we 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 both talked about the the benefits potentially to to both sides, including the contractor, it may be that liquidated damages are seen as. Uh, too much or too much of a risk for the contractor to uh, take on the project. Um, and so you may find that you don't get uh, sufficient interest in, in tendering for your project, or once you've found your contractor, uh, then, then there's no appetite to take the liquidated damages uh, on or uh, the potential to increase the tender sum. So in them instances, what you can do is to make a claim, you can, you can have a strike out or leave out the um, liquidated damages clauses, and then you would then be left with making a claim for general or, or unliquidated damages. So you'd be looking really at similar sort of things that we mentioned for putting together a, a liquidated damages. 
uh, claim. Uh, so all those things like insurances, the loss of profit, all those things would come together in your claim for general damages. Um, but they do take obviously the time to to calculate and agree. Um, but you, but it can be done as long as, as we said, you keep keep the good records uh, and the, the justification. So in the scenario where the project has has overrun, the completion date's been missed, and you as the employer are left with the project not uh, completed by the date you wanted um, and not feeling very happy about it, you, you can then look to make a claim for general damages. So whenever we're putting a claim together, uh, we always talk about four essential elements. These are the cause, the effect, the entitlement, and the substantiation. So firstly, you have the cause. So simply, what is the event that has given rise to the claim? So in this case, it would be that the contractor has missed the contractual completion date. Uh, if there was a, another scenario, uh, it could be that a contractor has a claim for additional work or late access. But, it, but in this instance, it would be that the contractual completion date has been missed. You would then move on to the effect. Um, and so you, what, what we're doing now is we're demonstrated that we're demonstrating that the effect on which you're claiming is made because of the event. Uh, you are linking the cause and the effect together. So in our scenario, we are saying that due to the contractor not completing by the completion date, the employer is not able to take possession of the project. And that is now causing them to miss out on rental or other revenues of X, Y, Z, et cetera. So we've got the cause, missing the completion date. We've shown the effect, which is that we've, we've incurred these additional costs. But we have to ensure that we've got an entitlement under our contract. So there, is there a remedy for the entitlement? If there's no remedy under the contract, uh, then, on, then we haven't got the entitlement to, to proceed. So in this case, we're saying that by there is a breach of contract by not completing by the date stated in the contract. And then this is giving rise to the, the damages that we're, that we're looking to claim. And then finally, the big one that a lot of people miss out that we, we come across or I've come across in, in, in previous projects is the substantiation. So here we're, we're looking to prove on a reasonable level or on the balance of probabilities that the statements that we've made and, and the amounts that we're claiming are correct. So for this, we need all the calculations invoices, statements, all the programs that show the delay, photographs, so obviously looking at the, when the completion date, what was the, what was the position on site at the completion date, site meeting minutes, all these things that come together to show and prove um, to anybody that, that this project was delayed and that we've incurred these costs. So if we tick a box for each of these four things, I think you'd be well on your way to, uh, to obtaining the amount claimed either through negotiation with the other party or some form of dispute resolution. Okay, Stephen. So finally, for now, at least, um, from a practical perspective, what about the relatively common case where a contractor faces a liquidated damages claim uh, for delay from an employer, but the contractor says that the reason for the delays was due to the employer's failings or the issues that the employer faced. Okay, so um, obviously there's, there's numerous people on, on the, the webinar today um, and some of them who, who come from, say, a contractor background um, like, like I have um, may have well been in the situation uh, where, where we've been levied with liquidated damages. And, and I remember probably the first project I did uh, on my own as a, as a QS, um, I got a phone call from the contract administrator. It was a JCT project. We were seven weeks in delay on a school project. And we said we'd, we'd finish by, uh, <laughs> for some reason, we, were, we said we was going, the contract was going to finish by the start of the summer holidays. And in fact, it took us well into the start of the the following academic year. So as you can imagine, the school wasn't best impressed. Um, and the contract administrator rang me up to say later on that day, we'd be issuing you with a notice to, with our intention to be done with negative damages. So I went straight to my directors uh, with the good news and I was given two responses. One, 
<laughs> which wasn't very helpful was that this particular school or the council that looked after the school were being a bit petty and they never enforce LADs. And secondly, secondly, that the liquidated damages wasn't enforceable as even though we'd been de we'd delayed or we'd been delayed, uh, the school still opened on time um, and so did suffer no loss. So I went back to my the, the contract administrator. I kept point number one about them being petty to myself at that time, uh, but I tried point number two, uh, but it was just brushed away and the liquidated damages were still deducted. So taking myself back to that time, what do I think I could have done differently? Um, I could have perhaps gone a bit more onto the, onto the, the loss issue. So talked about it being a true estimate. Uh, could I have backed up my statement that it wasn't a true estimate? Could I have evidence that there was no loss suffered? Um, in reality, I didn't know that there was no losses that, that well could have been. Also, the contracts have been negotiated some time prior, signed by both parties. Um, I don't know how much success I would have had on that basis. The next one that ties into that is, uh, is it a penalty? Um, that's been touched on by yourself, Quentin, a bit, and I'm sure Sam will come on to that. So if a, if a liquidated damages provision seems to be penal, it, it won't be enforced. However, I have no basis, I have no basis for saying that. So generally in these things, it's it's a very high, it's a high bar to succeed. And so I wouldn't necessarily be looking into that. One that I do think you really should look at if, if faced with the uh, uh, as a contractor or any party that liquidated damages are coming your way is are there any extension of time still due to you? Um, I know from experience that practical completion dates can be debated and formalized sometime after the project's finished. Uh, and extension of time entitlement still can discuss well past that period. Um, I would suggest that you, you look deeply into that, uh, look at your delay analysis uh, and bring that to the table, um, try and negotiate that. If not, it may be that dispute resolution can, can produce an answer for you there or give you some respite, but it's certainly something that you should, you should explore in the first instance. It's also essential that we understand our contract, that we've reviewed it, we understand it, but also that the contract's been administered correctly. In simple terms, check your contract. Um, it may be certainly in JCT there are notice provisions, and it may be that, that these haven't been complied with, um, or the, the wrong form as stated in the contract hasn't been used. Um, one, I've used JCT there, but use NEC. The project manager is responsible for your the payment assessments and, and any deductions, uh, but it may be on a large project that the the, Q, the, the QS is doing the payment assessments and they aren't delegated to do that and send you the notice. So you, you've got to clearly understand your contracts and make sure that, that all everything's being complied with. And if it's not, you may have a claim or uh, an able to negotiate that the, the extension of time or the liquidated damages aren't valid. Uh, we could also move on to prevent, you could look at prevention. And this would be where there's a, there is no mechanism within the contract for an extension of time for the particular act that's caused you this delay. Or it could be simply that the, it's the employer who has stopped you from completing by the completion date. This again ties into the extension of time, but there's something to be, to be wary of and mindful of as you, as you try and look to defend this claim. Another one would be, uh, finally, would be that completion was actually achieved earlier than has been certified. So um, it could be that completion date was on a certain date, but you know yourself that the employer was already using parts of the building before that date. Uh, it could be that, in your opinion, uh, the practical completion was, was already was done, but the project manager, the contract administrator, was demanding absolute perfection uh, or being slightly overzealous. This would need lots of factual evidence. Uh, because as long as they've been using their professional judgment fairly and lawfully, it will be difficult to prove. But overall, I would say that when you're looking at an extension of time claim uh, in, in respect of defending against LEDs, you need to make sure that you've got all your extension of time claims in with the contract administrator or project manager and that all the contract provisions have been complied with. And if they haven't, they would be your better chances of defending against the employer in that instance.
Great, Stephen, thank you very much. That's useful. Um, Anthony, if I could come to you now, um, and if I could ask you to comment on another important topic that we've touched on a few times now, which is delay. And first, if you'll forgive a compound question from me, um, which delay analysis techniques are the most widely used and why? Uh, typically ones that engage some form of critical path analysis, uh, because it's the analyst's job uh, to distinguish uh, the critical delays from other delays, which may have caused some kind of disruption, but ultimately didn't delay the project. And critical delays by the definition, ones that delayed the project, not, it's not something that was kind of an annoyance that was a delay, but something that delayed the job. There isn't a one size fits all approach and it isn't set in stone, uh, but some useful guidance can be found actually in the Society Construction Law Delay and Disruption Protocol. The second edition that came out five years ago has six main uh, methods of delay analysis uh, and under core principle 11 on page 34, uh, there's a table and some text underneath and that describes each of the main methods uh, and when you might want to apply them, the best circumstances to apply them. But when we're dealing with um, liquidated damages, we're discussing something that's usually already happened. So it's something that's time distant. And therefore we'd engage most commonly one of the four retrospective methods. And of those, in my experience, the most popular for a few reasons, tends to be a as plan versus as built analysis, where we compare the as built program uh, against the plan, uh, work out what happened and why. Um, and that tends to be the most popular. Three main reasons uh, why that's the case. First of all, is what's known as an effect and cause approach. So first, the analyst will establish the effect of delay. So what was delayed and by how much? And then we investigate the cause. That has a distinct advantage over perhaps some other methods, which may start with a delay event first and then model the effect of that. In Asplan versus Asbuilt Windows, we're, we're looking at the project as a whole. Secondly, it's what's known as a static analysis. So there's no software modeling. That has a major advantage for most people because you're not then faced with using or trying to understand planning jargon. So things like uh, constraints, the total flow, free flow, as soon as possible, leads and lags and those kind of things. They're less common in this type of analysis because you're not using the software. Thirdly, uh, and most importantly, it's heavily rooted in fact. So the starting point for this analysis is gathering all of the project data. And we mean things like progress photos, project reports, contemporaneously updated programs, meeting the next, and those kinds of things to really establish what happened and when, and then we can compare it uh, back to the baseline program. Uh, if I quickly describe just the steps to go through, it might help you uh, realize why this kind of method is considered more forensically reliable. So as I said, we start with the facts. That usually starts with a lawyer or one of our clients calling. Uh, we're having a call with them and they say, well, what do you need? And I usually say everything. And then there's a few eyebrows raised at that. But what we're really talking about is all of the key uh, contemporaneous project data. So some of those things I've just described, meeting minutes, progress reports, commissioning records, marks of drawings, whatever we have to really establish what happened and when. Then when we do that, we, we collate all of that data and we will produce an as-built program. And that's usually in line with the plan program. So we try and compare like for like, and where we need to, we can go into more detail, but typically we'll compare like for like. Once we've done that, we will then establish what was delayed and by how much. And we call that the effect of delay. And then thereafter, we can use those project records to investigate the causes. Typically what we will do is it's quite important to understand what happened and when and how the critical path may have changed over time. So what we will do is we'll divide the as-built program into discrete time periods. And there's a number of ways you can do that. Again, it's not set in stone. Um, it will be dependent on the project, but typically that can be in line with the reporting periods. That's often monthly uh, because you've got reliable data at regular intervals then. But what's also quite common is to break a project down into different phases. Um, and by doing that, what, what you're trying to establish is what was delayed. So you don't focus on parts of the project phases that weren't delayed, just on where the delays were, and really getting into the detail there to establish what happened and why. So what, what, once we've done that, so we've, we know what happened and when, why it was delayed, it's then a job to try and uh, apportion culpability um, you, under the terms of the contracts. Typically that's a legal exercise that we've done alongside um, legal representation from the parties kind of sits outside our expertise a little bit. We do get asked for opinions on it, but really it, it, it's, a, it's a legal matter. So, so yeah, for, the, for those key reasons, really, just to, uh, just to, to summarize, 
So it's an effect and cause approach, as plan versus as built windows analysis. It, it looks at the project as a whole. Secondly, it's easier to understand because there's no planning jargon. And thirdly, it's heavily rooted in facts. Everything supported by evidence, contemporaneous evidence from the project. Okay, Anthony, thank you. So um, if a relevant event um, occurs during the currency of the works, what preventative measures or what might a contractor do to avoid the application of liquidated damages? This kind of ties into what Steve was saying with his example uh, previously. First of all, you might want to consider if the delays can be mitigated or not. And maybe there's some conversations to be had there between a contractor and an employer to try and, uh, to try and mitigate some of those delays. But on the assumption that it isn't, what's some advice that a contractor could take? Well, first of all, make sure, again, this, uh, as Steve was saying previously, make sure that you fulfill your contractual obligations. So things like notice provisions, what have you, make sure you, you, that those are applied and fulfilled. Uh, secondly, you might want to understand if you have uh, the ability to make a claim. So check, check the terms of your contract. Thankfully, the standard forms have mechanisms in there for you to do that. You might need to check whose uh, who's commercial risk it is under the contracts. Maybe that will be obvious or maybe not. And then you might need people like Sam to try and, uh, to try and help you uh, determine if you can make a claim or not and whose risk it is. Main piece of advice is for contractors, don't wait. Don't wait until the end of the job to try and resolve this uh, because you may be starting from a losing position. Maybe damages have already been applied. If a, a delay event is about to occur, you know it's, it has the potential uh, to cause a delay, make the claim at the time. Uh, and to do that, you will have to engage some form of prospective delay analysis. Again, differs from retrospective, it, it's fundamentally different because you're, it's some form of modelled analysis. You're using software to predict um, a theoretical delay on your project. There's two methods of doing that. The best, the best way to do it, kind of accepted as the best way, is something that's called uh, time impact analysis. Again, it's quite it's described quite well in the in the protocol, and it's actually the uh, the method of analysis which is described, although not by name, under the NEC suite of contracts. And this simply takes the most recently updated program and then applies the delay event to it to calculate or forecast this hypothetical delay. It's a fair way of doing it because it will give you the net effects of the delay. If the contract is ahead, well, then a delay event may have less effects on the project if they're ahead of program. Or if they're behind of their own making, well, they shouldn't really be entitled for those delays if they have their own culpable delay before it. So just to answer the question, so my advice would be comply with those provisions, first of all. Um, don't wait, make the claim as soon as you can, and then engage the proper analysis, probably in the form of a time impact analysis, and then make sure it's fully supported uh, with evidence. Thank you. I think it's very useful. Um, Sam, if I could turn to you now. So Sam, I thought it was a, quite a nice lead in to, um, to something I'd like to ask you, um, which is what types of liquidated damages clauses do you typically see in construction contracts and, and um, subcontracts? Obviously, the, there's differences between standard form of construction contracts, such as JCT and, uh, and NEC. But in essence, you have, first of all, there's just simple liquidated damages clauses, i.e. those provide X pounds per day or per week or per month. Then there's more complex or, or, or um, different kind of um, negotiated ones where there might be staggered or staged um, clauses, i.e. clauses that either have an, an initial period of grace or LAD holiday or, or clauses that gradually increase over time the longer the delay extends. There's also the issue to consider of um, sectional completion. So if there's sectional completion, um, it's a good idea to have separate um, liquidated damage uh, sums for each sectional completion. Otherwise, it, it might be um, considered void for, for not being a, a genuine pre-estimate of loss, uh, amongst other arguments. But generally, in all types of these LAD um, clauses, um, they're identified as an exclusive remedy for the breach. Um, so, um, and in this case, we're talking about, for purposes of today, delay. Obviously, you can have LAD clauses for other breaches, but given um, Decipher here, we're focusing on, on delay. Um, moving on to talking about subcontractors, this is, of course, a very knotty area that raises all kinds of issues. However, fundamentally, the issue concerns the difficulty in predetermining what the consequences will be of a subcontractor's delay. 
However, there's perhaps a couple of ways this can be addressed. First, one option might be to limit the total liability of the subcontractor to the main contractor for a percentage of the subcontract sum. Or alternatively, the subcontract might just include an overall limit of liability clause, which obviously technically isn't a liquidated damages clause, but it's, a, it's obviously aim is to kind of limit the subcontract's liability. You mentioned um, the example of where a clause might be void because it's not a genuine pre-estimate of loss. And so I wondered, in a, in a nutshell, what are the requirements for a liquidated damages clause? Well, thanks, Quentin. Actually, from a legal stance, the requirements are fairly limited in some ways. Um, but some key points to take away are it's important to be specific and clear. So set out a clear starting date from when uh, LADs are, are, are intended to run. Um, it's also to make sure, like in the in the construction context, of course, that it's important to make sure the contract particulars are consistent with any schedules, other parts of the building contract. And obviously, as, as the audience will be well versed on construction contracts and tender documents can be vast and spread over various schedules and appendices. So it's important when, when finalizing the contract that there's no kind of conflict between any schedules and the particulars and, and, and tender documents haven't been kind of left unamended because that can lead to uncertainty. And then again, a clear measure of, of, the, of the liquidated damages is important. Again, whether that's daily, weekly, monthly, or some other measure. Um, secondly, um, in terms of moving on from being specific and clear, um, and as I touched on before, it mustn't be a penalty. I'll say more, more on that when we come to the case review, but, but in essence, it, it shouldn't be penal in nature. And then another thing to consider is notification. Um, some forms of um, standard building contracts, in particular JCT, have um, provisions when it comes to enforcement of, of LEDs regarding notification. So this can be subject to amendments to the standard contract. So when coming to consider um, liquidated damages, it's important to have regard to your specific contract to make sure all the notification requirements are met. Otherwise, you can find yourselves with a situation where you can't enforce your, your right to liquidated damages. So um, thanks, uh, Sam. Um, Sam, you mentioned case law. And as we turn towards wrapping up and, and hopefully a little time for questions, um, what are the key developments in the case law um, that those in the audience should be aware of? Thanks, Quentin. Um, Given the limited time, I'm going to limit my, my kind of talk to, to, to three topics. Firstly, are liquidated damages an exhaustive remedy? And on that, I'll touch on the case of Temlock and Silent Vector. I'll then move on to the distinction between liquidated damages and penalty clauses, get focusing on Dunlop and Cavendish Square cases. And then finally, I'll touch on the impact of termination in the triple point case. So firstly, is, is the liquidated damage an exhaustive remedy? Well, the first case that I'm going to touch on is the Temlock Errol Properties case. It's a 1987 case. The facts are fair, fairly simple. I won't go into the detail, but, but the key point is this. In the contract, the parties inserted nil pounds as the rate for liquidated damages. The court's view on that, the liquidated damages provision represented an exclusive remedy for delay damages. The result, the employer was entitled to no damages for delay. But what you might, given what um, has been mentioned um, by Stephen, uh, what about general damages, you might think? Sadly for the employer, it could not resort to a claim for general damages. By inserting nil into the clause, the court's view was that the parties had made an express provision for the consequences of delay. There was therefore no room to imply a term for general slash unliquidated damages. But what, what you may ask, what if you leave the LAD clause blank or insert not applicable? Well, there was some guidance on that point via an Australian arbitration case. And that's the silent vector versus Squarcini or Squarcini 2008 case. In considering a clause that provided NA, the arbitrator found that the insertion of NA 
meant that the liquid, liquidated damages did not apply at all. In consequence, it's different to the, to the first case, a claim for delay general damages was permitted. So if we just pause there uh, and take a step back and think about it, and what, the, what are liquidated damages, as Quentin touched on in the introduction, liquidated damages are an express contractual remedy predetermined and agreed by the contracting parties. So in silent vector, they were silent about what they wanted to do about delay damage. So, so there was a right to general damages. In contrast, in the, in the, in the um, first case of um, Temlock, it had been inserted nil. So the court view on that, that the parties had agreed an exclusive remedy for the liquidated damages, but unfortunately for, for the employer, that exclusive remedy was nil. Um, I doubt that was the intention, but that's where they ended up, sadly. So moving on to the question of penalties. So the starting point is a, a 1915 case, Dunlop Pneumatic Tyre versus New Garage. I won't go over the facts again, but I think it's important just to, to kind of discuss a few kind of main points arising from Dunlop. In Dunlop, terminology was not considered conclusive. The essence of a liquidated damages clause is that it is a genuine pre-estimate of loss, whereas a penalty is intended to intimidate. And, and also an important consideration is the clause must be considered at the time the contract was entered, not when it is breached. In essence, the, the, the message from Dunlop was we're talking about compensation. Surprisingly, the, it took a hundred years for this to be developed uh, and considered by the Supreme Court. And it was considered in two cases um, that were heard at the same time. That's Cavendish Square, L. McDaisy, and the Parking Eye cases. Again, neither of these cases are construction related, but are still relevant to those drafting and or considering challenging liquidated damages clauses in construction contracts. In given judgment, the Supreme Court has, has been clear that compensation is not, in all circumstances, the only potential legitimate interest an innocent party might have in a timely performance of the contract. Instead, the Supreme Court's view is the test is to apply when assessing liquidated damages is whether the clause imposing, imposes a detriment out of all proportion to any legitimate interest of the innocent party in the enforcement of the primary obligation. The Park and I is probably the most straightforward way of illustrating this proposition. And it may be something that we've all come across in our day-to-day -day Saturday shopping. The issue in the case was whether the request for payment of £80 for overstaying a two-hour parking limit was a penalty. On the basis of the genuine pre-estimate of loss test, um, going back to, back to the original case, the test, the clause may well be considered to be a penalty. Little tangible loss, if any, could be said to be suffered. However, the proposition is different if one applies a legitimate interest test. The leg legitimate interest here is the prevention of people overstaying the two hour parking time limit, I, to enable proper kind of circulation of traffic. So as such, in consequence of Cavendish Square, the question to consider is, is there a legitimate commercial interest? What is it? Uh, and does the LA do LAD some relate to it. So what does this mean? Well, in short, the impact of these cases is that it will be more difficult to successfully challenge liquidated damages clauses. The Supreme Court in this case and in the court generally, when considering other matters such as liability caps, is adopt adopting a stance of reluctance to interfere in commercial contracts. Where a contract is negotiated between properly advised parties, of comparable bargaining power, there is a strong presumption that they are the best judges of what is a legitimate provision dealing with the consequences of a breach. So to answer the question, what does this case mean? The answer is that the time to discuss, challenge, negotiate liquidated damages is at the outset of a contract, 
don't wait till fighting it out when you face the kind of commercial difficulties of a delay claim and a, and a large bill for liquidated damages. So moving on to the third area I touched on in the case of you, and that the impact of termination. And this is the, the, the well kind of tread uh, review of the triple, triple point case. This is an IT case again. So the problem, where liquidated damages provision is purportedly linked to the completion of the works, what happens where there is no completion? In the Court of Appeal judgment, the decision was that the liquidated damages provision has no application where the contractor never completes the work. That decision was appealed and, and the Supreme Court addressed the following issue. The key question before the Supreme Court was, are liquidated damages payable for the period between the contractual completion date and termination? The Su Supreme Court found, oh, so overturned the Court of Appeal decision. In doing so, it highlighted the importance and function of liquidated damages clauses in providing remedies for particular events. The Supreme Court clarified that liquidated damages clause will apply up to the date of termination unless otherwise agreed by the parties in clear and express wording. So the outcome of triple point is that you can agree something different, but the default position is liquidated damages apply up to the date of termination and then general damages thereafter. Thanks, Quentin. Thanks very much, Sam. So just um, with an eye on the time, um, we've had quite a few questions come in on the Q&A. Um, and so what I thought I would do is give each of the three panellists the opportunity to choose and answer just one question. And if you were to take two or three minutes each, then that would, that would be ideal, I think. Um, and so if it's okay with you panellists, um, if I could ask you to do that in the order that you first spoke. So I'll, I'll start first with Stephen and then Anthony and then move to Sam. So, so Stephen, do you want to have a look at the chat questions and, and, and Q&A questions and select just one to answer in a few minutes? Yeah, so uh, yeah, thank you for people sending in the questions. Um, there's, there's some good ones here, but one that I've noticed that I think is quite interesting is one from Mark Hurst. Uh, he says about what options does a client have if they have established stated amounts for delay damages in the contract, but these later prove to be insufficient to address their losses arising from the delay in completion or sectional completion? Is the client confined to only recovery of the stated sums at the stated rate? And the answer is yes. Uh, as the parties have negotiated at the outset uh, the liquidated damages, the amounts, and hopefully gone through all the things that we've discussed this morning, how to put that rate together, there was your opportunity to um, put everything down and, and that would be your remedy. So the, the, the simple answer is that if you think there is a potential that the losses you incur are too uncertain or, uh, you know, or there is a risk that you, you might not find out till later on uh, what they will be, uh, is to actually, as, as I've covered and, and Sam has, uh, as well as Quentin, is to keep, uh, to, to, to leave the liquidated damages uh, blank, uh, or strike it out completely uh, and leave it then to a claim of, of general damages. Uh, so as long as you've got the records and all the information, uh, you, you, you'll have a, uh, you know, the cause and the effect. Uh, entitlement and substantiation, as we talked about, you would have a, a good chance of succeeding in a general damages claim, but not in going out back for a second bite of the cherry because you liquidated damages doesn't have sufficient uh, numbers for you in that instance. Super, thanks, Stephen. Um, Anthony, I wondered if, if you had a question that you'd like to take um, a crack at. Yeah, yeah, there's, um, there's a question there from, apology in advance if I pronounce your name wrong, Edward. Edward Moiley, yeah, I think it is. The good question, he says, in your experience, has there been an issue raised by, by the employer? in a claim for using a certain delay analysis method, and would it be better for the parties to agree on the delay analysis method and state it in the contract? And then is it, uh, is it the right time to make recommendations to the drafting committee to, uh, committees of institutes issuing some of the forms of contracts? 
Um, we have had issues. I have, in my experience, we have had issues from employers, but it's usually claiming that they don't understand it or maybe don't want to understand the method that's been applied. Um, whether we should start putting them in uh, contracts, well, the NEC already attempts to do that. So if you look at, if you read the guidance notes for the NEC suite of contracts, if you look at the section of the uh, the time assessment for compensation events, it describes one of the uh, one of the methods that's named in the uh, the SCL protocol, so time impact analysis. So if you have a look at that, and it, it it takes you through the process of how that's done. I don't think there's a one size fits all approach. I'm not sure there would be a benefit of putting them in contracts. And the complaints that I often see on, on either side is more how it's been uh, the application of the method rather than the method itself, um, because there's certain things to consider when performing a delay analysis, it, it, the things like the records that are available to you, whether there's an, uh, a planned program uh, available, there's all different things to consider. So I'm not sure, maybe people have got different views on whether we should start putting them in contracts, but the NEC does already attempt to do that, um, but, but, not, but not the others that I'm, that I'm aware of. Anthony, if I, Anthony, mm. if I can just come in there, just in terms of, um, I would agree with what you said. I think where the parties uh, are in dispute and they do require a delay analysis to be undertaken, I think when it gets to that point, then the respective parties' experts should potentially agree on the basis of the analysis to be undertaken before one goes in one direction and one goes in the other direction. And then there's a big debate about what method top, top trumps the next um, so we've seen that in so much as a lot of time and energy expended and wasted by experts going off in different tangents. Um, but I think it would help the process of litigation and, our, and, and certainly dispute resolution if the parties' experts um, did actually get around the table and agree what records they had, what's the best analysis. Because at the end of the day, it's there to help the parties that reach a settlement and the courts to hopefully make, you know, make that um make that award um so that i would I just want to throw that one in there from practical experience yeah. as well yeah no no i, I no and i agree with you and about there's one um, i know it was a while ago now but there was a there was a question raised by the judge in the walter lillian mckay case that said depending if you do regardless of what method you apply if you're done correctly it should give you the same answer well the answer well actually that isn't the case um and perhaps a whole other discussion to have another time but i completely agree with you paul if you can agree between experts at the outset which method you're going to apply you might get closer to it and then you can start to narrow the issues um and, and you know there's some more consideration maybe there is value in putting it in contracts um but yeah some interesting topic something perhaps to discuss in a, in more detail another time i think yeah absolutely um sam i appreciate you've had possibly the least time of all to look at the question, but I wondered if there was one that um, that you would like to take a pop at answering. I have had been able to scan them. There's one here that uh, if LADs in the JCT D and B are calculated based on loss of rent, the contractor runs into delay, but the client does not suffer any loss because they haven't secured a tenant anyway. Can the contractor challenge the level of LADs or does the figure in the JCT apply regardless? The short answer is the liquidated damages apply. Um, the longer answer is if we take a step back and think about the difference between general damages and liquidated damages uh, and what Quentin said at the outset, the starting point for, for, for liquidated damages is the parties are trying to buy certainty. Um, the contractors trying to effectively manage risk limit its liability the employer wants to know what wants to know what it's going to get to cover its loss if there is delay so there's no issue in, in contrast in the case for general damages it's a question of proving the loss so you have to go through each of the state each of the stages and actually prove a loss so in a general damages case the answer would be different because the contract, to, oh, sorry, that the the kind of employer wouldn't be able to prove that it suffered any loss because it hadn't been able to secure a tenant anyway. Um, but in the liquidated damages, it's the pre-estimate of loss and it's genuine and there's no basis to challenge it. Super. Well, thank you very much. So I'm going to um, wrap up now um, just by thanking all of the panelists very much for uh, for your time and inputs and for answering those uh, Q&A questions um, at the end. Thank you very much. Paul, I wondered if you wanted to say a few words. 
Yes, absolutely. It's um, it's it's obviously a, a, politi- a, a hot potato topic. Um, there's been some great comments and discussions this morning. Um, hopefully, everybody, the attendees have, have taken some uh, takeaways from this uh, session. I want to thank you, Quentin, for moderating, um, Sam for giving your legal advice, Anthony for giving your delay, and uh, Stephen for giving your quantum experience and expertise. Thank you very much once again. Hope you've enjoyed it as much as we have, and see you again soon. Bye-bye for now. Guys, thank thank you. you. Pleasure. Thanks, guys.